back seat with a uh, blanket over her, I think it Thinking along the road, what did he say? Stop here? Yeah, pull over the bus stop. Set off to, to meet her at the bus stop, has he? Well, uh, you I wouldn't believe he has. Hugged the grave, the body was disposed of, uh, certain threats were made to me. You're obviously prepared to say that he's murdered her? Yeah. With what? Any idea? No, no. I'd... Say just uh, I think she's still there where uh, I indicated to uh, Inspector Preston. Why did he choose you to be the driver? Deceased in the back seat. Uh, unbeknownst to me at the time, but he was a builder. In the back of the car was a shovel, and I was instructed uh, under protest to dig a grave. It was sandy soil, I dug the grave, the body was disposed of, uh, certain threats were made to me, person to be scared of. He was a violent person, he was a big person. And uh, that is what led to uh, the burial of Lucille Gay Butterworth uh, in 1986. The police suspect is a man who was living in New Norfolk in 1969 and was known to Miss Butterworth. Police are investigating whether she accepted a lift with him the night she disappeared, mistakenly believing she'd missed the bus to a fundraising meeting for the Miss Tasmania Quest. And this is where the trail of Lucille's known movement ends. What happened from here on no one knows. The man has served jail time for an attack on a woman, is in his 60s and still living in Tasmania. Police are urging anyone with information about the SEAL's movements that night to come forward and are still hopeful whoever is responsible will confess. They did an horrendous thing at a period in their life. Now is an opportunity to possibly do a great thing and balance the ledger. And that is resolve what happened to the SEAL. Miss Butterworth's parents died without knowing what happened to their daughter. Her brothers John and Jim and fiancé John Fitzgerald still struggle with her disappearance. Well, all of us have been desperate over the years, as, as you can understand. So it's just uh, uh, there's nothing. You know, you can't put these things to rest until such time as there is an answer. Police are trying to pinpoint the whereabouts of her body. They believed it was dumped in bushland somewhere between Claremont and New Norfolk. Edith Bevan, ABC News. Huh? It'd be fun to drive, wouldn't you? Huh? It'd be fun to drive. Yeah, very much. 
Yeah, right. Yeah, boy, this, I didn't intend to buy them. It's just advertised with the Rolls to it, but they'd only done 18,000 when I bought it. God. And it's in good nick. only done 40 odd now. I'll turn this up. Claiming that he too is now dead. That is what led to uh, the burial of Lucille Gay Butterworth. Lucille was, as claimed, at a Claremont bus stop. But was she waiting for a bus? Uh, he recommended to go to uh, Claremont. Uh, he picked up a girl at the bus stop at Claremont. Um, you know, take me up to Claremont. Uh, right, stop here, you know. It, it, to me, it seems that uh, it's pre-arranged. Lucille and the other man are together in the back seat. They are driven to a nearby cemetery. She is dead within the hour. I started going for a walk. By this time, it was... Uh, Nine years later, in 1986, the mystery should have come to an end. The man who allegedly buried Lucille Butterworth is in a Western Australian prison. He is delivered into the hands of Tasmania police. He is returned. We're going to cut to the chase. Let's start with how long ago were you working in that area, Don? I look at it, Roughly? I'd say it must be about 40 years. 40 we years. did the first subdivision in there for the housing department, which was in that area, right where this bloke Sage is talking about. You've just seen the interview with uh, Lance Lesage. He's the man who said he drove the car, drove the man who allegedly murdered Lucille to Gilston Bay. He describes the area. Not then he's Wilson Bay, uh, 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 Canelian Bay. Canelian Bay. Bay. Mm. He sees her in the back seat. He realizes that she's dead. He drives her to Kingston, and buries her at Kingston. And you're saying now that, not that many years later, you're working in the area and you dig up some very suspicious looking bones. Yeah, I was just clearing the area where we put the road through and I was tidying it up along the edge and there was a big heap of dirt, loam, sandy loam, black sandy loam been, must have been tipped there by trucks, a uh, couple of loads I would have thought. And as I was pushing this, all of a sudden, a cage of, of uh, bones come up sitting on the top. It hadn't been broken or anything, just complete. A cage of bones. Yeah, uh, rib bones. So you're talking that you actually dug up somebody's rib bones? Now well, you know so that something. Some I didn't. I wasn't sure at that stage whether it be human. Or I thought it. I thought it must be some sort of animal. So then there was a young chap driving another machine. There's only two of us on the job. Uh, he and I had a look to see if we could find other bones to decide what sort of animal or what the hell the thing would be. And we could find nothing. We could find no skull of any animal or human. And I'd been lived in the area now of 87 years and I must have been, I must have been about pushing 50 at that stage. Uh, I knew that no one gone missing in the Kimbell area. And I thought, well, it couldn't possibly be human bones, but at the same time, I couldn't put it out of my brains that maybe it, it might. So, even though uh, you've probably been around animals, like a lot of us yes. as, as young people, like kangaroos, yes. uh, sheep, maybe, yes. you knew that it wasn't a kangaroo carcass? There's nothing like a kangaroo carcass, or nothing like uh, a sheep, but I had never seen a goat or anything like that. Uh, so I, I wondered whether it was a, a 
goat or something like that. That's why I wanted to try and find a skull. But you seem to be pretty suspicious, Don. It, it, it alerted me, so much so that I even put it beside a concrete curb and gutter. Uh, my recalling is, and this particular week, this last week I've been there, my son got permission from the Kingborough Council to disturb the footpath to look for something, and we even saw the footpath up and we found that the whole thing had been disturbed with uh, Telstra cable and uh, stormwater pipe. So this happened recently? The digging up. You guys? You, know, you and your son? This week, this week. Dug it up this week. What made you go back there? Big one. What made you go I there? I would like to get, well, I got that pair of, a lady brought me that paperwork of yours and that alerted me because she used to go out with one of these footballers and uh, I had mentioned a name or two and uh, so it, the whole thing has worried me ever since because I suppose if I ever feel, well, when Sage put that in the paper or the police put it in the paper all those years ago, they brought him from Perth, I didn't, it didn't register on my brain straight away either. But I happened to be driving, I used to own Hobart coaches and I was driving a bus up Hawthorne Avenue one morning and I saw an excavator in the bush digging, digging. And I thought, what the hell is they digging there for? So they were the police looking for Lucille? That, that was, must have been the police looking for Lucille. Now some days after that, in the middle of the night, I woke up and it said, told me on my brain, oh my God, that's very close to where, where that excavator was digging and where I found those bones that time. So I reckon well, this sage is telling the truth. That's what I thought. Well, it's very coincidental, isn't it? More than coincidental. That he <laughs> describes an area yes. that you find suspicious bones or a, or a carcass of some kind. And in those days, there wasn't a house within a bull's roar of that particular job. It was the end of the, end of the road. And there wasn't a house within the bull's roar. Now, when Sage came back and started digging, there were houses and streets everywhere. And he was digging within 100 metres of where right. I found it. So, for anyone to say, anyone to discount his story completely, it's a mistake to discount his story totally. If he's, I would think so, yes. If he's given you, given the police a location, he's given me a location, yes. and then you find this carcass in that location, yeah. it's too coincidental. Absolutely, yeah. Now, <clears throat> Le Sage was taken there by the police in 1986. That's when he went there. Yeah. You had found that carcass, or those bones, prior to the police being there. Yeah, long while prior. Because Lucille was killed in 1969. And that's when I woke up that it could be Lucille, it could be human, and I went straight to the police. And they took me to the university to have a look at skeletons and for me to tell them what I, th if there's anything in there that I thought I saw, that what I buried. Did and you go to the police first, first up? I went to police first up, yeah. With the bones? Oh, no, no, I didn't have the bones then. Right. No. no, I'd already been. I told them what I'd, where I'd put them and what I thought about them. And I, they took me there to identify what I thought I'd buried, what was similar. And I picked out a particular skeleton in the centre. I said, to this particular part there, I said, what's that belong to? He I've got to stop you then. And I've got to, got to backtrack and put this yep. into, into sort of... Um, uh, a, a sort of stepping stones. After you found the bones, you were suspicious. What did you do with them? I buried them close to the road we were putting in. You reburied? I just covered them up close to the, to the curve and gutter we'd put in. Right. Which was a field, the gutter was above the land, and I was just bringing the dirt up to it. When did you tell the police? When did I tell the police? Yeah. As soon as I read that in the paper, they brought the sides back from uh, 
Right. First, it come onto my brains that it, he could right. be telling this bloke's telling the truth. So, for simplification and clarification, you found the bones, you looked at them, you're a bit suspicious, you reburied them, and then forgot about them because it didn't mean anything to you. And if ever I made a mistake in my life, I must have been then. <laughs> but and in those days, there wasn't a telephone in your pocket or anything like that, and I no. was getting my business going and had a young family and I didn't want to have a lot of... So, didn't. understand that. Carcass only, rib cage only, yes. no head, no, no skull, legs. No soul, no other bones whatsoever. And the rib cage was it complete. Nothing, not one bone broken. On. Very important. When the police went back in 1986, that's a long passage of time since before when she disappeared, did they contact you to take you to the area where you found the rib cage and reburied it? I, I have a job to remember for sure, but I would think I took the cop to the spot where I buried them. I said, that's where they are. But in 1986, when they... When the Sarge would come back from Perth. Right, so you, were actually, you think you were contacted? I, I contacted the police first. They took, and then they took me, they took me, had an interview, then they arranged to take me to the, univer uh, the university to look at skulls, and after that I would think, I, I would think, uh, my memory tells me that I'm pretty sure I took this detective and showed him there's only one detective, that's all I was. You don't remember a name? No. So you took that detective to where... You remember burying the bones? That's right. At what stage was that? Just remind me again. How do you mean what stage? Well, was that during the Lesage search? Just after, that was after. Oh, right. Mm. So between the time that she disappeared to the time you found the bones and from the time you found the bones to the time of Lesage, you had no interaction with the police. You didn't even think about it anymore. I didn't know anything about it. And time. you never even considered it might it might have been Lucille until 1986. Yeah, never had a clue that it would have been. Right. What do you think now, Don? I think now that it uh, I would be almost 99% sure that it must be Lucille Bertilleau that I actually had my the cage in my hands, these two hands. How do you feel about that? That's why I'm here because I'm. I'd like to get get it solved or get to everything. Did this? I'd like to see the market charged. Right. This, to me, is very vital, vital, fresh lead. Yes. To me, it is. Mm. That's my instincts as a as a journalist doing a story. This is the sort of stuff now that probably should maybe go before a coroner. Yes. And maybe there should be an inquest called. Yes. So while you are still about to give evidence. Would I like to give evidence? Would you give evidence? My word I would. Let's see if we can bring it about. Yes. Thank you very much. Right. Yeah. Now, how thoroughly, how thoroughly did you go through uh, the dirt and stuff to well, examine. Well, we spread it all out over the grounds, what was there, these couple of truckloads yep. after the cage part come up. We put that to one side, I guess. We must have done because we looked after it. <laughs> and then we tried to find a skull or any other bones to determine what, it, what the cage belonged to. And we could find zero, nothing. So you had suspicions right there when you first found that rib cage that it was human? I had some suspicion. I must have done it. Otherwise I wouldn't have gone and buried it and gone to the trouble I did. And then years later you were taken into... A, a, you were taken in to identify the human body. In the university. The police took me in to the university to have a look at all the different uh, bodies, uh, what do you call them, skeletons they had there. Yeah. There's quite a lot of them. 
I said, can you pick out what you think you would have found? And I went and had a good look at all of them and I said, this, this particular one here, this is the part I found. I said, what's that girl doing? And they said to me, that's a young lady. Right. That's fantastic. Now, in your opinion, the police are not trying to hide anything. They would like to get it resolved as well. I hope they do. You'd like to see it resolved in your lifetime? My word, I would. How long have you been living with it for? Big about How long have you been living with this for? Well, I suppose uh, ever since that Lesage come back from uh, Perth and it came out in the Mercury. That's what alerted me that it must be human. You, in the intervening years and the time that you found that, to the time Lesage came on the scene, did it come into your thoughts from time to time? I, I couldn't truthfully tell you that, but it, I must have certainly had it on the... It radar. triggered something off. Yeah. It triggered it off. Mm. Now, is there anything else you need to be saying before we go? <laughs> okay. The only thing I'd like to say is I'd, I'd do anything I can with any coroner, any police officer or anyone to tell my story, to try and get the truth out so that someone could be charged for this terrible thing that must have happened. Well, thanks for coming, Matt. Much appreciated. Real pleasure. Okay. Nice to meet you. Okay. You'll hear from me again, Don. Okay. I really appreciate it. Well, I appreciate it. Take it easy on the way home, mate. You've come a long way, and I thank you very, very much. Real pleasure. All the best. I hope you got a few things off your chest. Well, we can only try at this late stage, try and repair any damage that I should have done.